Hello. As we continue our study today from the book, The Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey, look into the background of Jesus, and specifically his Jewish roots. In this study, our goal is to get to know Jesus in a way we may not have previously been able to do so. To know Jesus' story, <clears throat> similar to know anybody else's story, we need to delve into one's culture, their history, their background, and their family. When you think about it, Jesus alone, from anybody else in history, had the ability to take and pick and choose where he was to be born. So why this place and time, this little town in Bethlehem, in the shadows of this giant Roman Empire? If he came in modern times, he could have used mass communication and reached on out to the whole world. Or back in Isaiah, Isaiah's day, when the expectations of the Messiah was high and Israel was still an independent nation. What in the first century made it the right time for God to step into the world? Anticipation at the time of Jesus' birth was high for the ushering in of a new era. In fact, the Roman poet Virgil coined the phrase, actually making him sound like an Old Testament prophet, when he declared that a new human race is descending from the heights of heaven, a change that would come about due to the birth of a child, with whom an iron age of humanity would end and the golden age would begin. Virgil wrote these messianic words, actually not about Jesus, but about Caesar Augustus, considered the present deity of the time and the restorer of the world who had managed to reunite the empire after the civil war was created by the assassination of Julius Caesar. To loyal subjects, Caesar Augustus offered Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Rome would keep peace, of course, at the point of a sword. Rome assured its citizens protection from outside enemies and enjoyed the, the benefits of Roman government and fair treatment. During this time, a Greek culture was also moving through the Roman Empire. People throughout the empire dressed like Greeks, built their buildings in Greek style, played Greek sports, and spoke the Greek language, except for the Israels. Palestine would be the one conquered region of Rome that would exasperate Rome to no end. Jews not only resisted Hellenization, the imposing of Greek culture on others, but at the same time they also fought the Roman legions. Rabbis would fuel this by reminding the Jews of Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a Greek general over a century before who after conquering Palestine attempted to force Greek culture upon the Jewish people. It culminated in what became known as the Abomination of Desolation, where Epiphanes invaded the most holy place of the temple, sacrificed an unclean pig on the altar uh, to uh, Greek uh, god Zeus, and then smeared his blood all over the altar. As we know, this led to the revolt by the Maccabeans. Jews still today celebrate Hanukkah in memory of this victory. And for nearly a century, the Maccabeans held on off foreign invaders. That is, until Rome rallied and they rolled into Palestine in 67 BC. It took 30 years from 67 BC to 37 BC for the Roman army to snuff out all signs of rebellion. It's reasonable to say that during that 30 year period before the installment of Herod the Great, that no less than 150,000 Jewish men died in revolt of the Roman army. Jewish men perished in these revolutionary uprisings and during this time, there was no more explosive and inflammatory place in the world, certainly not in the Roman Empire. By the time of Herod on the throne, though, 
not only Jerusalem, but the entire country lay in ruins. Palestine stayed relatively quiet, though, under his iron rule, partly because the rebellions had drained the spirit and the resources of the Jews. Then in 31 BC, an earthquake killed 30,000 people and considerable livestock along with that, leading to more destitution. The Jews called these tragedies the pangs of the Messiah and pled for God for their deliverer. Christians perceive this cry from Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As a profound moment between father and son. Jews, however, view this in a different way. Verse 22 is another cry on out to, Jesus, to God for those Jews that have died from torture. Jesus was not the first and certainly not the last Jew to cry out these words from the Psalms. Herod the Great actually still reigned when Jesus was born. In opposition to the Hellenization that swept through the rest of the Roman Empire, Jesus grew up in a time of resurgent Jewish pride. As part of this, families had begun to take and look back to the times of the patriarchs and the exodus from Egypt when they named their children. Not really that much different from ethnic Americans who choose African or Hispanic names for their children. Thus, Mary was named for Miriam, the sister of Moses, and Joseph was named after one of the twelve sons of Jacob. So were three other brothers of Jesus, the fourth James, actually being named after a derivative of Jacob. Jesus' own name, as we know, comes from Joshua. He shall save, which is really a common name back in those days. Its commonness must have irritated the pious Jews of the day. For them, the name of Yahweh could only be spoken once a year by the high priest. The idea that such an ordinary name like Jesus could be the Son of God must have just been such an irritant to them. Even more, the region of Galilee got little respect from the rest of the country. It was the farthest province from Jerusalem and the most backward culturally. Rabbinic literature at the time portrays Galileans as bunkins, fodder for ethnic jokes. Furthermore, speaking the common language with a northern dialect would be a telltale sign of Galilean roots, and as Simon Peter one day would find out, betrayed him in a courtyard because of his rural accent. The Aramaic words in the gospel show that Jesus too spoke this northern dialect, even further encouraging uh, doubt about him by the leaders of the day. And Nazareth, a town so obscure that it does not make the list of 63 towns listed in the Talmud, gave even more doubt to Jesus' incredibility. Thus the statement, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? With this prevailing thought, we see that Nicodemus tries to defend Jesus. The Pharisees then ask him, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Finally, we see that Jesus was raised in poverty. His family could not afford a lamb for the sacrifice at the temple and offered instead a pair of doves or two young pigeons as laid on out in the book of Leviticus. Eight million Jews lived in the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus, with just a quarter of them in Palestine itself. Sometimes these two million Jews living in Israel pushed the Roman Empire to the breaking point. Romans regarded Jews as atheists, for they refused to honor Greek and Roman gods. They looked upon them as misfits because of their different customs. Jews refused to eat what they called unclean food. They conducted no business 
Friday evening and all through Saturday, and they did not participate at all in civic office. But still, Rome granted Judaism legal status, but this would come at a cost. If they cooperated, it meant submitting to government interference, and if they didn't cooperate, it would mean harsh persecution. Herod the Great would keep the Jewish leaders in a state of suspicion and terror throughout it because of his network of spies. It was during this time that the Jews split into different parties. The Essenes were the most separate of all. They were pacifist, and in such, they did not actively resist Herod or the Roman government. But instead, they withdrew into monkish communities in caves deep into the desert. They were convinced that the Roman invasion has, had come as a punishment for the failure to keep the law. Because of this, they devoted themselves to purity. They took ritual baths every day, held to a strict diet, took no oaths, and held all material goods in common. They hoped that because of their faithfulness, they would encourage the coming of the Messiah. Another group, the Zealots, were also separatists, but they advocated armed revolt to withdraw to overthrow these foreigners. One branch of special uh, one branch specialized in political terrorism against the Romans. Others acted like morality police. For example, zealots said that anyone who married outside of their race should be terminated. Obviously, we know one of Jesus' disciples was Simon the Zealot. On the other hand, Jesus' constant contact with Gentiles and foreigners must have driven most of the zealots crazy. At the other extreme were Jews who tried to work within the system. The Romans had granted limited authority to a group called the Sanhedrin, but in return they had expected them to help them scout out any signs of insurrection, such as from the Zealots itself. Sadducees, another group, were the most blatant about cooperating with whoever was in power. Humanistic in their theology, they didn't believe in a life after, and they also didn't believe about divine intervention on earth. So since there was no future system or reward or of punishment, they might as well enjoy the limited time they had on earth. And they certainly did, as you would expect. They enjoyed the finer things of life. Of all these parties, the Sadducees had the most to lose from any threat to the status quo. Pharisees were the popular party of the average Jew. They held to high standards of purity, particularly on matters of Sabbath. Also, ritual uh, cleanliness and the exact times of festivals. They treated non-observant Jews as Gentiles. It's important to understand this group had suffered their share of persecution. In one instance, 800 Pharisees were crucified in one day. In another incident, Pontius Pilate reneged on an agreement with the Jews that he would not enter Jerusalem carrying images or icons of the emperor. The Pharisees regarded this as idolatry. In protest, they stood outside Pilate's palace for five days, crying and begging him to change this. Pilate threatened to put each one of them to death if they did not stop this protest. As one, they fell on their faces, bearing their neck for the sword, preparing to die rather than to have their laws broken. And Pilate eventually backed down. This kind of begs the question, which party would you have followed? The Essenes, where you removed yourself from any contact with society? 
about the zealots willing to be a part of uprisings and revolts against the government? The Sadducees, they certainly seem to have it all. Respectability among their peers, also while at the same time enjoying the comforts that were afforded to them and available. For all the criticism the Pharisees have gotten over the years, you have to admire their willingness to stand up for principle. Probably more than any other group, they stood on the edge of Jesus' audience, watching him with the burning issues of the day. For all their differences, though, all these groups shared one thing in common, to preserve what was distinctly Jewish, no matter what. And obviously, Jesus represented a threat to that. Would Jesus have won us on over if we were in one of those four groups? We can't say. At one time or another, he managed to confound or alienate each one of these groups. Jesus, of course, held out another option that incorporated neither separation separating from society or collaborating with the Romans. He was to change the way we looked at following Caesar or Herod to following the kingdom of God itself. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll continue this study with Jesus I Never Knew next week.